And a very warm welcome to another episode of the Lizelle Wellbeing Show. And today we are going to be talking about brain fog, a curiously common collection of symptoms which give rise to a loss of mental clarity, foggy thinking, difficulty concentrating and issues with memory. Well, as we know, it affects many women at the point of menopause. And yet when you search brain fog, on the NHS website, you will draw a complete blank. No results found, it says. So here to tell us more about this condition and how to treat it, menopausal or not, I am joined by Dr. Sabrina Brennan, a chartered health psychologist, neuroscientist and author of the international bestseller, 100 Days to a Younger Brain. She also heads up Brain Fit, a large scale research study on brain health, lifestyle, genomics and dementia risk at Trinity. College Dublin. And we have just had a fascinating long chat about her most recent book, Beating Brain Fog, as well as her experience with these often debilitating symptoms. Well, don't forget, if you would like to watch our chat today, the video podcast is available on YouTube. And as always, I am looking forward to hearing your thoughts on Instagram after the show. So without further ado, let's go. So Sabina, thank you so much for joining me today. It's such a fascinating subject and there's so much in the news, isn't there? Increasingly, I think about brain health, I guess the focus on mental health, but really about brain health in general. Yeah. And I, you know what? I'm I'm really so pleased that there is, that people are starting to talk, talk about it and think about it. When I started working in the specific area of brain health. Um, I mean, I did my PhD around that, but in around 2010, you know, nobody was actually even using the word brain health. I got funding from the European Commission in early 2011 to develop a program to raise awareness about brain health. And I remember at the time thinking, what can I call it? Because people were calling it like, you know, your cognitive health, your cognitive function. And I said, I can't call it that because... I didn't even know what cognition was no. till I went to university to study psychology. So I can't start with something yes. that I have to then explain to people. And not saying I, I invented the term brain health, I didn't. But really, I the the website that I developed, which still exists, um, hellobrain.eu. If you if you searched for brain health, that was the only thing pretty much that came up. Now, since then, I mean, I think it's way down the list now, but there's brain health everywhere. And I mean, that's just it's really, really good. But I think it's important as well um, to draw that distinction, you know, because sometimes people do think that brain health and mental health are the same thing. I will always argue that, uh, you know, brain health, if you look after your brain, your brain health, your mental health and your physical health will follow. They're all interlinked. Mm -hmm. Um, But I see mental mental health rather than when we're talking about mental ill health we tend to be talking about things like depression and anxiety and um, eating disorders and schizophrenia and those kind of things when I'm talking about brain health I'm talking about the organ itself keeping it healthy so that it can support you to be you so so that it can support your memory function your ability to make decisions your ability to find the right word in a conversation you know to be quick and sharp to have a funny retort you know, in your sense of humor. So, um, I mean, your brain literally supports absolutely everything that you do. And I think it's kind of rather amazing, really, that people have ignored it for so long. I know we've just sort of left it to get on with itself, hasn't it? Haven't we really? But I think, you know, that's a really interesting distinction between the kind of the mental illnesses, if you like, that you've touched on there and keeping our brains healthy. And I guess for me, what, why I was particularly keen to talk to you about your latest book about beating brain fog is that such a, a classic symptom of aging and we are hopefully all aging and we're going to age well. For you, what, 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 what is brain fog to you? Is it something that's just with aging or, or how did you come specifically to want to focus on brain fog? 
Yeah, I would say actually it's not specifically, you know, associated with aging. It is associated with menopause, which is in turn associated with aging. Um, And I think that's an important distinction. I think that and I'm kind of glad, really glad you brought it up, because as we age, there is a misperception that you have decline in memory function or decline in cognitive function as a consequence of aging. And that's not true. The, The brain can age quite well and you can hold on to cognitive function um you know relatively well into later life disease is actually the cause of most decline in later life so diseases such as dementia um different types of dementia alzheimer's disease um uh, you know, Louis body dementia, frontal lobe dementia, there's various kinds um, mm. of dementia, but that is neurodegenerative and that's different. That's not just as consequence of aging. Now with age, we do see atrophy or wasting like you would with our muscles as we get older, but that atrophy, that wasting starts actually about at the age of 30. Um, oh and it's very gradual. It it accelerates. Yeah, it accelerates when we hit 60. And then it, you know, multiplies when if you have something like Alzheimer's disease. But the thing is, um, you know, in my first book really is all about, you know, brain health and, and, and how to reduce your risk of developing dementia and keep your cognitive functioning as you age. Um, really, the, the tips for brain healthy life, a lot of the things that will keep your brain functioning um, well and and we now know can also stop that um that that wasting you know you can actually mm. maintain your brain volume um and functioning by engaging in a brain healthy life um actually i would argue that that it's not age that your brain starts to atrophy from 30 it's just from about that age you stop doing a lot of the things that underlie a healthy brain so um learning um you know challenging your brain education they're all brilliant for your brain health so too are exercise physical exercise sports right. you know eating well learning new things having new experiences sleeping well um you know you know maybe in your 30s you start to have kids and you're you're, you're sleep is disrupted. So they are yeah. kind of things that we, you know, we, we sort of stop doing. But the good news is that the research shows that you can, you can, um, you know, if you live a brain healthy life, you can kind of um, prevent that atrophy from occurring, which suggests really that it's not necessarily age that's doing it because age is sort yeah. of, it's an empty variable. I mean, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To, 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 like, so, what are the symptoms if, if if we think we might be having brain fog or something to look out for? Is it you know? Do you have a so, kind of a checklist yes, so, of symptoms? Yes, I, I think what I'd like to explain first is brain fog is not a disease, it's not a disorder, and it's not a diagnosis in of itself. However, it does exist. Um, it really is a warning sign that something is amiss. It is a signal to take action. And that action can be trying to see, is there an underlying um, condition that's leading to this? What is bringing about the brain fog? If you think of it like, you know, a cough is not a disease or disorder in itself. It is a symptom right of something and you've got to figure out why you why you have that cough and there can be many many reasons that you can have a cough and mm-hmm. um, similarly there can be many reasons that you have a change in your urinary function you know go needing to pee more often you know and yeah. you go to your doctor and you see what it is that's going on so brain fog is a bit like that your brain is malfunctioning and it can be malfunctioning for a number of reasons um it could be as a consequence of an underlying health condition. Um, it can be related to hormonal changes, um, nutritional deficiency, um, and certain lifestyle factors and choices. So essentially with the book, I kind of wanted to arm people with information about all of those things. You know, the hormone, there's a chapter on hormones, there's a chapter on yeah. infection, inflammation and chronic pain um, to help people, you know, kind of tease apart, you know, whether some of those things ring any bells. Now, it's not about diagnosing yourself. It's about giving you the information that you can then take to your doctor in a very, um, you know, clear, recorded, systematic form to say, look, 
these are the symptoms I'm experiencing, you know, what do you think might be going on? Um, so yeah. the symptoms you asked for, and um, they're very clear and they're very sp- specific, really. I can, I can name them in terms of what we call them as psychologists, so executive functions. So that would be problems with focusing, with concentration, you know, really just feeling um, foggy, you know, that thing where just it's, it's just not right. Then there's yeah. attentional problems. Um, then there are memory and learning um, issues. So memory and learning are, are, are inextricably linked. Um, you know, learning is really sort of the first step in the memory making process. You have to kind of learn a piece of information. And I'm not talking rote learning, but, you know, you you have to engage in an activity, take information, your brain learns about mm-hmm. it. And then if you repeat it, you can, you know, store it as a memory. So though both of those can can happen. So a lot of people with brain fog will say, oh, I keep forgetting things, but I can't take in new information. You know, the, you know, there's people have said to me, you know, no matter how many times I ask my son to show me how to set a series link on the TV, I can't, it won't go in. So that's kind yeah. of a learning thing. Another more general thing is uh, processing, processing speed. So a slowing, it's just a bit like slowing down in terms of I can't run as fast as I used to, but it's that... It's a slowing down. So it means that you can take in maybe what someone is saying and process it as quickly as you ordinarily would. Um, uh, Language issues. So that can be the proverbial word finding that, you know, all of us kind of experience at at various times. And then another final one, which um, people might find unusual, and we call that it. We call it problems with spatial navigation, but most people would describe it as clumsiness. Right. And that's not a physical thing. That's a brain thing. So basically with brain fog, it's just an area of your brain that actually, you know, literally navigates space around you and it makes judgments and adjusts your body so that you can walk between the table and the chair. Um, But if that's off with brain fog. Um, you misjudge and you bump into things or you drop things or, you yeah. know, um, and that's a that's a brain issue. So people can have some of those symptoms. They can have all of them. They can have some severe, some not so severe. Um, I think the important thing to point out is every single one of those things that I have listed, those symptoms, um, everybody experiences them at some point. You know, I mean, if you've had a couple of nights disrupted sleep, you're going yeah. to be struggling the next day to take stuff in or to make a decision. Um, uh, if you've, if, if, if you're chronically stressed, you know, um, uh, but with brain fog, the kind of brain fog I'm talking here, it's ongoing, it's persistent, it's prolonged. You know, people have, have experienced it for quite a period of time. I actually, I was, I was listening to your, I was nearly late for the podcast because I was engrossed listening to your, um, and watching you uh, talking. I love your series on uh, menopause. I was learning so much. I just wish I knew them before. Before, but I was really, really fascinated, and I was listening, and I was just so engrossed. And then I went, "Oh gosh, what time is it?" Um, <laughs> well, I, I definitely want to want to come on and, and talk about hormones, but I'm really interested in these different changes and on the kind of the, covering off the medical side, if you like. First, are we looking at these changes? Would it be somebody, for example, who may be ADD or ADHD that hasn't been diagnosed that possibly gets picked up later in life as these types of conditions can develop? Um, no, not really. I mean, generally, brain fog is associated associated actually a lot with um, with uh, conditions that disproportionately affect women. Right. So, um, a lot of autoimmune diseases will have brain fog as a symptom. Uh, so, lupus, Sjogren's, uh, which I have myself, um, uh, multiple sclerosis, so multiple. Cl- Sjogren's. Mm. So autoimmune diseases, just for listeners, I'm just, um, uh, I'm sure they may already know, but it really is where your um, immune system attacks your own cells. And there's different types of autoimmune diseases. And each one will attack different, you know, different diseases uh, attacks. So rheumatoid arthritis is, a, is an autoimmune disease, also brain fog associated with that. And that attacks uh, the joints inappropriately and causes terrible pain. Uh, Sjogren's that I have attacks your moisture glands. So your salivary glands, um, your mm. eye glands, and, and moisture glands elsewhere in your body. Um, so um, 
uh, yeah, and so brain fog can be uh, um, associated with that. So a number of those, but also um, uh, inflammatory diseases like um, mm-hmm. celiac disease, um, right. uh, um, metabolic metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes, um, hormonal conditions as well as just hormonal in, in, imbalance. So th- th- yeah. thyroid or Hashimoto's yes. um, disease. So there's actually really quite a lot of conditions, some cancers. And then, of course, as I, I didn't mention earlier, it can also be a consequence of a side effect of a medication that you're taking for a condition. So um, you may have heard of chemo brain. So that's brain fog associated with chemotherapy. You may also have heard of fibro fog. So that's brain fog associated with fibromyalgia. Um, I use brain fog as an umbrella term to to take all of those um, different uh, conditions, you know, into account because um, really any sort of chronic health condition can give rise to brain fog. Mm-hmm. Um, also, any severe, you know, if your body, so basically inflammation play a role, your immune response plays a role and pain plays a role. And, you know, at the moment we're living through a pandemic and mm-hmm. um, we're actually seeing a huge increase in brain fog. Uh, lots more people talking about it. So I would see that in a positive way that actually, you know, it will, I, I don't want people experiencing brain fog, but if more people are talking about it, we may shine a spotlight on it mm-hmm. and get more research invested into it and and get people heard when they go to to their to their doctors with brain fog but if you've had any sort of serious infection so for example sepsis um you know you'd be really critically ill with um sepsis so it's really quite common for people with sepsis to have brain fog for up to a year after really? they have initially recovered yes yeah. and so we are seeing something similar with long covid people mm. are having debilitating brain fog i, I you know it's hard um, until you've had it it is hard to realize how debilitating it is. So I actually did a special feature of my own podcast on long COVID last summer because I knew the minute COVID came, that's going to affect the brain, you know, because of the immune response, etc. And um, I did an episode of uh, my podcast and I interviewed neurologists and, you know, the head of the sepsis trust and other neuroscientists. Mm. But then I interviewed um, people who were living with long COVID and brain fog. And these were people who have really, really important professions who cannot go back to work. They Mm. cannot function. So one of them was a a public relations officer for Mersey side police or something like that so she Mm. said she couldn't trust that she wouldn't say a pedophile's name or you know give out information that she she shouldn't another was a a cambridge university professor who asked me not to name her uh, because i had written a piece in the times about it uh, because she was afraid it would impact on um Mm. you know what her colleagues thought of her and another was an anaesthetist oh um, so these exactly these people, people you know be sharp, yeah, don't quite, you? yes absolutely and yeah. and you know some of them have sort of said look like actually the individual the university professor she said she set three fires in her kitchen because she had forgotten that mm-hmm. she had left you know the stove on um the anaesthetist told me that she couldn't kind of cook dinner anymore because she couldn't remember the sequence to do things in. So it really, really can be debilitating. The good news is that um, I uh, I actually put a call out to volunteers before the book was published last year. Um, And I went to various kind of groups. So these were people that I didn't know at all. So I went, for example, to the Migraine Association of Ireland because migraine... um, um, uh, brain fog is, is associated with migraine and I went to, uh, you know, the MS Society and people involved in menopause. And then I also contacted mm-hmm. a group um, of people online. There's a long COVID Facebook group. Um, so they, they uh, you know, a, a small number of volunteers who uh, were happy then for me to share their stories afterwards, actually read the book and took the the, the 30 day plan. And the first feedback mm-hmm. I got back was from a 30 year one year old who's had brain fog since she got COVID last April, April 2020. So almost a year. And she, uh, I wish I had quotes in front of me, but she uh, said it. she was sceptical. 
<laughs> you know, but she was desperate. And she said yeah. taking the 30 day plan has just transformed her life. She is yeah. back at work. She didn't realize. And the thing is, there are some very simple things that you can do. You have a lovely episode on 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 your podcast that I just listened to today. And I'd urge anyone to listen to it. And it really is about the importance of sleep, you know, yeah, and and, and, oh and how sleep is critical. I, <laughs> I devote a whole week of my 30 day plan to sleep. If you can get yeah. that under control, you know, you really will see an, an improvement in your cognitive function. So she really focused on that. That made a huge difference. But also she hadn't been exercising because she was fatigued. And mm. so she thought that you know, you know, if she tried to walk, she was exhausted and she said, right, I need to rest up. Actually, no, you've got to start exercising yeah. and you've got to start very, very slowly and very gradually building it up. Yeah. And actually, she told me she was doing online yoga classes, you know, from someone who she said she couldn't walk to her hall door without feeling exhausted. Yeah. Um so but sorry, I, I'm talking loads, but I'm yeah, very yeah, kind of excited I, 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 that it I could help like people. To, to come back and, and talk a little bit before we move on just about that long COVID, because there's been interesting new research, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it, showing that long COVID is actually MCAS, the mast cell activation syndrome. And that, of course, plays very much back right. into the autoimmune issues that you're talking about and, and how, you know, the autoimmune issues are affecting the brain and, and, and triggering that, that brain fog. So I think this is an yeah, area. I mean, I mean, that's what I had emerging science, isn't it? All of this we're learning all the time. It is very emerging science. I mean, I certainly think that way back, um, you know, certainly when we started seeing it, I said, we're going to see new autoimmune diseases because the yeah. immune response that has to kick off in response to this, yeah. you know, is, is is so big. I mean, number one, you'll have brain fog when you are ill, when you are fighting a serious infection, because your body, your brain has to devote all of its resources to keeping you alive. That's a priority. Remembering where you put your keys isn't a priority. You know, making decisions about what to wear isn't a priority. Everything has to go into getting you better. And that's why we have certain illness behaviors where it's go to bed, sleep, retire. It is all about recovery. And that's quite normal. But then um, we have possibly with long COVID, you know, that the immune response has got, um, you know, messed up in some way. Yeah. And then... Um, we have the possibility that there is. So this MCAS, somebody actually, um, I had an article in the Sunday Independent here in Ireland the other mm. day, and they actually contacted sort of me about that. Um, I mean, it's yes, it's emerging research. It's really interesting. Um, I myself, I, whether it was COVID or not, I had um, myself and my husband and my mother-in-law had a very, very bad virus in February. So mm. it was way before we had, you know, lockdown or anything like that. Um, and um, my husband was actually worse than me. You know, my son is a doctor and he'd had, um, you know, he said, gosh, you need to get antibiotics. And then they didn't work. And then he needed steroids. I was sick and coughing a lot, um, but not as bad as him. Mm. But he recovered. But I was six, eight weeks later, still coughing all night. Yeah. I was exhausted. As I mentioned earlier, I have an autoimmune disease. I felt my brain right. was foggy. I yeah. felt I had fatigue that I hadn't had for a very, very long time. And yeah. I just, I got a rash, a mad rash across both my so shoulders that kept me awake at night. I still have some of it. Um, yeah. And where I would just tear my skin open, you know, um, and my PJs and my bedclothes would be covered with blood, but I just had to tear it. You know, it was this, um, and so, I, I mean, I, I've been to my various doctors about it and, and my dermatologist said, she said, look, whether it was COVID or not, it was irrelevant. It, it, it was a very serious virus, whatever you had. And that's yeah. probably, you know, post-viral rash. Would, would that, be, um, would that um, be a histamine reaction, do you think? Because there is a role, obviously, with histamine <laughs> and the immune system. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I would be sort of that, you know, I would have been at the time, even when I had this on a daily antihistamine. So I would have mm. a lot of those um, those kind of responses. Uh, yeah. Interestingly, I've actually come off that antihistamine now. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, and, and the thing for people to understand is all of this is happening in your brain. Right. Um, you know, we tend to really think about things happening in our body, but your brain controls everything. And as if you've said in your in your really great podcast you know you've got hormone receptors in your brain all over yes. your brain you know let's talk about the the role of estrogen in the brain what is it actually doing why why would we have estrogen receptors in our brains well, you know, estrogen is involved in lots of things, you know, lots of functions in the brain. You know, I mean, hormones, the brain itself 
communicates with the with itself with you know the the cells um by electrical and chemical signals and um we use neurotransmitters to do that so that's very sharp um fast communication hormones on the other hand are um they are a longer lasting form of chemical messenger and they really uh aim to ensure that your entire body is on the same page. So it might have a primary function, but it really, you know, and that's why you have estrogen receptors everywhere. So it's like everybody gets the memo. Okay, you know, this is what we're doing now. And the thing is, (laughs) the thing is that estrogen, you have estrogen receptors in your hippocampus, uh, which is a a seahorse shaped part of your brain in the limbic part of your brain, or or some people call it the emotional part of your brain, but it is critical to, um, to learning and memory. So, you know, whilst we might, might know exactly what it's doing, it's there. And when we lose it, you know, we can see an association, uh, with aging and, and memory loss. So whilst we mightn't have the detail, what we, what we're understanding, you know, is that, definitely estrogen are involved in much more than just you know mm. what we would associate it with as, as just yeah. sex hormones yeah. uh, it's a bit of a that's, that's it's a really bit of a, a misnomer really that's really interesting talking about the hippocampus and and what these different bits of the brain do because i've spoken to many perimenopausal women and menopausal women over the years and many of them not only talk about brain fog and memory loss but also this feeling of being very flat this lack of joy. And presumably that's coming from the estrogen decline in that part of the brain that's controlling our mood and our emotions and our experiences there. Yeah. So the hippocampus, the hippocampus is so, so I wish I had a, 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 a little diagram. I do have one in my book, very little, but if yeah. you think of our brain from an evolutionary perspective, we have three brains. We have one brain, they're all interconnected, but the brain stem that a lot of you will have heard about on, uh, you know, if you've ever watched ER or any sort of, you know, medical drama, that's, that's your brain stem is also known as uh, the reptilian brain. From an evolutionary perspective, it is the oldest part of the brain. It's an unthinking part of the brain. Uh, You've no control over it, but it keeps you alive. It controls your breathing, digestion, your heart rate, all of those things. That's why you hear in these dramas, you know, oh, their brainstem dead or whatever. You could only survive then if you were put on a... Uh, you know, uh, a ventilator or a machine to do your breathing for you. Then the next part of the brain to evolve sort of sits on top of that. And that is, we call it the limbic brain, but it's also referred to as the emotional brain. The hippocampus that I mentioned that's involved in learning and memory is in that part of the brain. But so too is the amygdala, which is very much involved in emotions and in your fear response and very much involved in the stress response and your stress levels and and, uh, your response to that. There's also another part of the brain in there called the basal ganglia, which is affected in Parkinson's. But it's a very important part of our brain in that it actually is a part of the brain that uh, helps us engage in habitual behaviors. So uh, the crinkly part of your brain on the outer part Part, the bit that we think mainly of the brain that then sort of sits over that the brain stem and the amygdala and it's all crinkly it's like a, you know it really is like an exercise in I- ikea style you know pack as much in as you can into the smallest <laughs> space possible and that's what the crinkles are you've got 86 billion neurons in there and they wow. are communicating <laughs> via electrical and chemical signals, via um, trillions of connections. And actually, I should digress because there is a woman who discovered we have 86 billion neurons in our brain, a Brazilian neuroscientist. (laughs) She did. She made brain soup. (laughs) (laughs) It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Everybody had always said, oh, we've about 100 million neurons. And she was doing research in that area. And it was her area. And she kind of went, where did we get that there's 100 billion neurons? And so she researched and there's there was no evidence. There was, you know, it was just like this figure kind of yeah. plucked out. So she said, how could we measure it? And so basically, yeah, she pulsed the brain, sort of made brain soup, was then able to see how many cells were in a little file. 
vile, very clever, kind of very simple, clever. but clever. But it I took a never woman look at to my liquidizer in the same way again. I have to tell you, <laughs> I know, <laughs> but it's wonderful. I think it's a wonderful story. But I also hate, and I'm digressing a little bit, but I really am passionate about the brain, and I, I, I really want to get people thinking about their brains. Uh, you know, the brain is a, it's the way we're used to seeing the brain, that horrible beige crinkly mass. It's mm. really unattractive and it actually looks um, like it's not up for much. Do you know what I mean? It just looks mm -hmm. like a blob of fat. And so any of your, you watching or listening to this podcast, just Google brain bow. So rainbow, not rainbow, brain bow. And what you will find are the most beautiful images. They look like Monet paintings. And basically, it's just from researchers use a particular protein dye to dye neurons, which are brain cells, different colors. And what you get is this fabulous image of it's like balloons upside down. So little neurons with the connections coming out of them and they're magnificent. And I would much rather people think of their brains that way as this really dynamic organ that is constantly um, on fire, uh, supporting you to be who you are and to, to do the things that you do. An incredibly, um, incredibly complex organ. And we really need to start looking after it and and valuing it that is just such a lovely lovely. i can't image. remember what question you asked me <laughs> so let's move on now to the practical steps that we can take to tackle symptoms of brain fog we've talked about what it is and how it works and the sort of logistics and mechanics of the brain what can we actually do once we've recognized it what, what are the steps that you advocate well, first of all, if you think that you may have an underlying condition or a hormonal issue, you go to a health professional, an appropriate health professional, and you get that, you know, sorted, diagnosed, treated, whatever. Um, but then you can work on lifestyle factors. And there really are four key areas. And really, this isn't, you know, anything new, but I can explain why it's really critical in terms of brain health. So the first thing to do is to prioritize sleep. Um, the thing is, when you go to sleep, your brain doesn't rest. It has a job of work to do. And one of the key jobs that it has to do is when you take in information during the day, that hippocampus that I remember that I mentioned earlier acts like a temporary repository for new information that you've taken in during the day. So then when you go asleep and you've mentioned this um, in, in, in when you're talking about sleep as well, you, you go through various different cycles in your sleep. In the early part of the night, you have non-REM sleep, more non-REM sleep and less REM sleep. And so you have about five cycle, five 90 minute cycles uh, a night. And over the course of the night, the proportion of non-REM and REM sleep change so that when you come to sort of the late the early morning, really, you have more dream sleep, which is the REM sleep, the rapid eye movement sleep. But in the early part of the night, um, when you first go asleep, we see electrical activity in the brain from the hippocampus going through to your frontal lobes. Now, your frontal lobes sit just under your forehead and they are the, they were actually the last part of the brain to evolve mm -hmm. and they are the last part of the brain to develop in humans. So they are involved in what we call executive functions. So those really what we call higher order functions, planning, organizing, decision making. And it's a really well connected part of your brain. So it is connected to all other parts and to your emotional brain, etc., so that it can have conversations, um, you know, through chemical uh, signals, etc. And it kind of has the big picture um, part of the brain. So we see this activity, first of all. And what we think is happening there is that your executive uh, part of your brain, your frontal lobe, is filtering the information that you took in the day to make a decision whether that information needs to be kept or can be discarded. Because forgetting right. is as important as remembering, because we can't take in all information. Your brain would be overloaded. So then after that happens, we then see a change in the electrical activity and we have much more diffuse 
sense activity. So your brain, uh, I mean, people will have an idea that memory is stored in the brain like it's stored in boxes. That's really not true. It, it is stored in these connections and in patterns of electrical firing and in networks of electrical firing. So it's almost like music rather than, uh, you know, a door that you open and you put a memory in. It's mm -hmm. each memory has a neural signature. And so we see then this more diffuse part of the brain because, you know, um, you know, when you take in a piece of information, it isn't just a piece of language or a word. It might have a smell associated with or emotion associated with it or a color or a visual. You know, all our experiences have all our senses. And that's a tip to improve your memory um, is to engage all of your senses when you are trying to keep a piece of information in. So that's mm -hmm. that new information starting to be embedded into your brain across your networks. So then as you go through the night towards the, what I would call early morning, when you're in that dream sleep, we see a change in the activity. And what we see then is, um, and what we hypothesize that is happening is that that new information is being integrated with your existing memories, your existing knowledges and your experiences. And so that's why you have those really odd dreams where it's something from today and it could be something from your childhood or, you know, some mad connection and they're all mixed in together. And really that's in that point, that's where insight and problem solving and creativity lie because your brain is making connections. And I always say to people, you know, if you're overworked, um, don't work late. You know, put the problem into your brain. Say, I need to figure this out. Mm. Relax, switch off, listen to music, have a bath, whatever rocks your boat in terms of um, allowing you to switch off and relax. Put the information in, let your brain do the work and you may wake up with the the solution the next morning. It may take more than one sleep, but trust your brain. It has all of that information in there. If you try to force it too much, you're actually putting too much um, pressure on it. So if you're, you're not getting that, enough sleep. Like the um, expression, isn't it? I need to sleep on it. I, I, yes. I need to sleep yes. On it. I, I love. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I love, I love, what I love about neuroscience is, because neuroscience really is, is relatively new in terms of what we're discovering about the brain, because it's been, it's because new technologies have developed that allow us to look at the brain in action and see what's going on when certain things happen. In the past, what we learned about the brain came from when it, it, it malfunctioned or when people had brain injuries or, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and you discovered that, oh, that's where vision is because when that's damaged, you can't see or that's where, you know, talking is or speech is because that's when damage. But now we can actually look at the brain when it's engaging um, in activities, including activities um, uh, like sleep. But I, what I love about neuroscience is that it is, uh, it kind of gives the evidence <laughs> to show that some of those, uh, you know, old pieces of advice, the pieces of sage advice, they actually yeah. are grounded in neuroscience, you know. So, yes, yeah. sleep on it. It, it, it really is um, important. And as well, during the day, what's really interesting during the day, well, I think it's interesting, <laughs> is that when you go into sort of like a daydream state, mm. if, if, you know, state where you are not actively engaged in an activity. Right. OK, you're not actively or consciously engaged in something. You are really daydreaming. You're just letting your thoughts wander or go where they will. What we find is that some networks in the brain actually become more active than when you're actively engaged in an activity. And that's called the default mode network. And we actually think that that is where insight um, and creativity and innovation lies because your brain is working away, making connections. Um, so I really do say that to people, you've got to trust your brain, you know, give it information, make connections. It will, that's where kind of ideas come from. Would that be like mindfulness yes. and, and, and meditation? Yes. Switching off to allow yes. that creativity and to happen? Yes. A lot of people think mindfulness is, is about not thinking, but it's just about not 
you know, focusing on on things. It's just about letting it happen. But also, I like to think about mindfulness as being present minded and being engaged. Yeah. So a lot of people say they struggle to relax or they can't do mindfulness. And I'm kind of a bit there, you know, mm-hmm. I'm a bit like that, you know, kind of sitting doing nothing is, is kind of hard for me. I would suspect with all your achievements that you might be a little bit like that. Um, but if you can engage, if there is an activity, I called it sort of finding your joy. Um, if there is an activity where you find yourself because you lose yourself mm. in the activity, you know, where you are totally absorbed in something, you don't notice time passing. That's a form of meditation because you are fully present in what you are doing. You're you're so lost in it. It's 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 pure connection. Um, and a lot of people have lost that joy and they say, oh, but I don't know what I could do. And I, I say, well, look, go back to your childhood. What what was it that you would be doing where your mum you eventually hear a voice and she said, I've just been calling you three times. <laughs> Why didn't you answer? Yeah. Well, you didn't because you were completely lost. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people, it's one of the suggestions I have that, that, you know, one key to managing brain fog is uh, managing stress. And uh, one of the suggestions, my key, su- the second week of the 30 day plan is all about managing stress. And actually um, really what what I prescribe for that week is for people to find their joy, to um, commit to, you know, doing for at least an hour every day something that either makes them laugh, smile or feel fully joyful. Um, because laughter um, diffuses cortisol. It lowers your cortisol level. Um, smiling has so many health benefits. Um, it is incredible. And I, I think, <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, that's my favorite. I end all my talks yeah. with that. Five, smile five times a day, you know, once yeah. first thing in the morning, because it's a great way to start the day. Once last thing at night is a great way to end the day and share at least one smile with somebody else because then you spread the health benefits and you can do whatever you want with the other two smiles. But it really does. It lowers blood pressure. It boosts your immune function um, and it releases serotonin and it also promotes neuroplasticity in your brain, which is the growth of new brain cells and connections, which you want. It's the one part of your body, ladies, (laughs) that you want bigger and better um, is is your brain. You want to be growing new connections um, and new brain cells. But I think with lockdown, people, I, I am concerned, people in a way, and it happens a little bit with menopause, uh, and you were touching on that. I'm eventually getting back to that question that you asked yeah. <laughs> about feeling flat. Um, mm-hmm. I certainly lost my sense of humor during uh, the menopause, um, yeah. and you do become depressed and 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 disinterested. And a lot of people have said, you know, they really lose themselves. And and the thing is, your mm-hmm. brain constru- constructs yourself. Uh, it is your brain that makes that sense of self that you have. And it makes it from various pieces of information, stories. Um, and a lot of that information is inaccurate, you know, but a lot of it, you know, you how many people do you know, believe that they're bad at something because someone told them at five that they yeah, were, do, do you know, which is really yeah. ridiculous. But our sense of self really is just a bunch of stories that we have either taken on board from other people or... have told ourselves um, and they can be changed. And unfortunately, when you go through the menopause, the hormonal changes can change very fundamental aspects of you. You can become more irritable, you know, lose your sense of humor. And that can, they are the things that are patterns of behavior make us who we are. That's how we're predictable. Do you know? Because you know, you always know, oh, Sally is always great for a laugh or, you know, if you want something organized, ask Mary to do it. You know, there are patterns of behavior and they get disrupted um, during menopause. And so we feel really lost, you know, really at sea. Where am I? Who am I? And then on top of that, you know, your kids may be growing up and leaving home. And so Mm. your roles are changing. You're not a mother anymore. And then maybe you're expected to be a carer. Um, and and the, the thing I would like to say to people, though, is that it is a real opportunity. You know, it is a real time to just revisit your dreams and start to search for them again, because for most of us, we spend most of our lives um, 
caring for and investing in others. Yeah. And I do think, uh, certainly myself, and I'll say this over and over again, your teens and your 20s are damn hard. <laughs> menopause is, is menopause is not easy. I wish I, it can be much easier. I wish I'd known some of the things that I've been learning um, over the last while when I was going through perimenopause. Um, but there are th lots of things that you can do to improve it. But I have to say, don't see it as all downhill from here. You know, we got to kind of bust that myth about, you know, barren old women, you know, on oh, your completely. way down. <laughs> Honest to goodness, we are, I would say, really in our prime that's the way I feel I feel I'm completely in my prime give me the world let me you know let me go at it and it's it's a really nice place to be and it's a message that I would love to get out to a lot of, a lot of younger women you know yeah. not to be thinking that you know they you know it's all going to be awful when you get to there it's not really yeah. um there are challenges no, and we live in a very ageist society talk about um gut health and the connection oh, yes. between gut health and the brain, because this is something that I write about a lot and exploring the connection, the vagus nerve connecting the gut to the brain. How does what goes on in the gut affect something like brain fog? Well, um, the, the, the uh, you've got lots. I mentioned earlier that neurotransmitters are the the, the chemical communicators in your brain, your your gut really is your second brain. It's often been referred to as the second brain. Um, and you've got um, you've got millions of, of, of neurons in your brain. And it is, as you said, connected to your brain um, and it communicates with it. But on top of that, you can I actually had the creeps when I was kind of writing this in my book. I'd love to find it um, in the section. But you've got it. <sighs> You've got this microbiota, you know, in your gut, which is really um, <laughs> lots of other creatures. It's um, it's um, uh, we kind of live in symbiosis. You know, we give them a nice, uh, warm, wet, moist uh, place to live. And they, in turn, help boost our immune function. Uh, they can help, you know, um, in that regard. If that's not working, then your immune function can kind of go out of whack and that can, in turn, um, impact on brain fog. But also, um, you know, if um, you can have a healthy healthy balance in, in your gut, much like, you know, healthy balance in hormones, if that goes out of whack, you can have hormones can, the, 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 your microbiota can actually really influence your behavior. <laughs> it can get right. you to do things. Um, so if you have bad ones, it can get, you know, it can, it can crave sugar and get you to keep eating sugar, you, you know, yes. uh, and in turn, That's and so then that can impact, yeah, do you know, I, 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 um, no, I, I was just um, talk, thinking about the foods that we can eat to promote the good gut bugs. Uh, but of course, we do have this battle going on inside and there are the bad gut bugs, just to you know be yes. simple about it. And they love the sugars. So presumably they've got the capacity yes. to, to tell our brain, eat more sugar. Feed me sugar. Oh, absolutely. Oh, stronger. feed me. Feed, oh, no. They, yeah, no, they can tell you what to do. They do. They actually tell you what to do. Much as the good bugs will, you know, engage in behaviors and be able to influence our behavior. It's quite fascinating. I find it kind of a little bit creepy sometimes just thinking about that because it really is like another organism living in inside of us. But it hugely and there are very, very strong links um, with gut imbalance and depression. And then in turn, uh, depression is very much linked with brain fog. Um, there may be other links. It's very early stage of research, but I don't know if you've read a book, The Psychobiotic Revolution. Um, I've heard of it. Um, it's on my book list. John Cryan. Yeah, yeah, have a read of it. It's it's really very good. I actually know John. I've presented at, at you know some science um, uh, events with him. Um, it's actually really well written. There's two scientists. They do all their research in that area, but then they worked with um, uh, an author and a journalist who helped tell the story. And and it really is very very well written. Um, and it's based. You know, I've read their research papers and then read the you know the 
the actual uh, book that's aimed at a an audience. And and that's a re- you know if you really want I mean I touch on gut he- gut health in my in my book because nutrition is really you've got to feed your brain, um, and you've got to feed it the right brain. You know rubbish in rubbish out. Uh, you know that really applies to your brain. What are um, the top brain foods that and- we should be eating? Well, what I would say is rather than think of individual soloists, I would think more like your nutrients in terms of an orchestra, you know, that that your brain needs a broad spectrum. So what I often say to people, and it's really quite simple, if you're going shopping and you want to go shopping for your brain, just think Mediterranean diet. Don't be worrying about specific macro or micronutrients. I do talk about them in the book and explain why you need them and what you need them and, uh, you know, why, you know, olive oil kind of is good. So actually a Mediterranean diet is the best, has the most research supporting it in terms of brain health. Mm. And it, it, to be honest, it is the simplest diet to implement. And it is such a tasty diet. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's very simple. You can t- I actually have some recipes in the book that I cook myself. Mm. Um, I mean, I make fresh soup every day. Um, it's lots of colourful fruit and vegetables. Green vegetables are particularly uh, good. Uh, oily fish, so fish like salmon. Um, Delicious. Nuts. Um, oil, get most of your fats it. from ol- olive oil. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, and t- to be honest, therein is a recipe for yeah. for, for wonderful foods and dishes and very simple yeah. ones. Um, I tend to, uh, one of my rule of thumbs really is, you know, I really don't buy processed foods. I, I, I cook from scratch. Yes, I will buy tinned tomatoes to put in, you know, a, a tomato based dish. That's different. You know, that's, you know, canning is, is kind of OK, but sort of ready prepared meals. I don't really eat bread every so often I fall off. You know, I mean, the thing is, you know, we're human. And, and, you know, if you if if you follow these things for most of the time, an occasional lapse, you know, sure. isn't going to destroy things. But it's a, it really is a fabulous diet. And you get, you know, maintaining a healthy weight is critical for your brain health mm-hmm. um, and maintaining a healthy, healthy heart is critical for your brain health. So. I think it's funny. People know a lot about heart health. And I would see the heart as really just a pump that services the brain. <laughs> uh, you know, it is. I mean, it's pumping the blood and the nutrients and the oxygen around. Uh, your brain only weighs 2% of your body and it consumes 25% of the nutrients. It's a really high energy organ. Um, and if it is not getting the nutrients it needs, it can't function properly. If it's not getting the oxygen it needs... Um, it can't function properly and brain cells die very quickly without oxygen. And your brain has a very complex job to do. And so regularity is critical. Eating your meals at a regular time, going to bed at regular intervals. Your brain has to constantly maintain homeostasis in your body. So that's like a status quo, keeping everything ticking over at the right level. And so it needs to know, I mean, it's really, of those 86 billion neurons, if you need to wiggle your toe, it has to make sure to send enough nutrients to that and fire that and make that work. If you're kind of starving it or you're eating at irregular times, it, it's making your brain's job much more difficult for planning actions and for, for organizing and for carrying out tasks. So you, you, you will struggle to do those cognitive tasks that we're talking about if you haven't been eating properly. You know that, you know, it, there comes a point, even if you're working through and you kind of go, no, I can't do any more. I need to eat. Or yes. I need to sleep. Um, and it's because you've just put your, your brain can't do anymore. You kind of go, I need energy. You need to give me something so I can do this. I can't, I can't run without fuel. You wouldn't expect your car to drive without putting petrol in it. And you're not going to put rubbish petrol in it. You know, you're going to make sure it's from a reliable, um, source. And, and you really need to do that. Um, you know, with the food, feed it well. And then you also exercise is critical. Physical exercise is, um, People are often surprised, but it is super important for your brain health. Um, not only, obviously, if you engage in physical exercise, you'll have a healthier cardiovascular system. So um, the, the the nutrients and oxygen will get to your brain better. But um, physical exercise, aerobic exercise, actually releases a chemical called brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF for short, but I like to call it miracle co- grow for the brain, right? Brilliant. Just think about it like miracle grow because it acts like a fertilizer. So basically, it is released when you exercise and it makes 
your brain more fertile to encourage the growth of brain cells and connections between them. And that's what you want. So exercise helps. That's a way that, remember I spoke hours ago, (laughs) because I talk so much. No, but at the start, I spoke about that, that atrophy that can happen from the age of 30. You know, if if what you want to do is is keep growing connections and brain cells, and so physical exercise helps to do that because it creates this environment that it makes it easier um, easier for those to grow. And then also the same thing is exercising your brain. It really is important. Learning is key. Your brain has this incredible capacity to adapt and change. And uh, the fancy term for that from a science perspective is neuroplasticity. And literally all it means is that the, your brain can change with learning. It can grow new connections or, you know, reorganize connections in your brain anytime it learns something new. And that's brilliant. And essentially, in order to keep your brain healthy and, you know, to avoid that atrophy, you've got to keep learning right across your lifespan. And it doesn't have to be academic learning. It can be anything. That is that is fascinating. We're going to have to draw it to a close there because we're all learning so, I'm so much. sorry. I talk way too much. No, <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, what a, an amazing romp through the world of the brain, everything from its structure to the things that it needs to thrive and grow. And I think ultimately that the things that I'm hearing here are that it, it is good news. There is a lot that we can do. It's not going to be too late. And that doing simple things like setting those brain routines can actually make a big difference to to how we feel and how we function. I'm hugely grateful for your time. I'd love to talk to you again. Absolutely. Sabina, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. And that is it for today's episode. Huge thanks to Sabina. And as always, you will find all the links and the resources mentioned over on lizalwellbeing.com, including links to Sabina's website, which is called superbrain.ie. Good name, yeah? Superbrain.ie. And you'll also find links to the many other podcasts and the articles that we have on HRT, anxiety, mood, depression, and brain health. There you can also sign up for the free weekly newsletter. This is filled with plenty of healthy recipes and tips for living well. Huge thanks to all of you who've left us such lovely reviews. It really does help others to find the show. So until the next time we chat, go well. Bye-bye. The Liz Earle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Liz Earle, with production by Amaryllis Earle and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue. With thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, and guest booker, Millie de la Morinière.